Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to the Lord's Day. Welcome to Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our podcast on the deep things of God. I'm Brother Mike coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona. The ministry uh, is hardcorechristianity.com and uh, a minister out of the Arizona Deliverance Center, which is in downtown Phoenix. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast. May God richly bless you today. I got an interesting Bible study for you. The, get, the uh, deep things of God are designed to uh, give you information that you would not normally hear at a church. This is a supplement to your uh, ministry and church experience. Uh, please do not stop going to church. I always advocate that uh, you need to start developing what I call terror cells, where you move into your church, you start terrorizing the devil by picking off the sick people. You only need two or three people gathered together in Jesus' name to set up a terror cell. And then as you uh, gradually see more people delivered and healed, uh, word of mouth will spread and, and you will be booming before you know it. A terror cell. That's your job. If you need to contact me, just give me an email at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. Be happy to answer all of your questions. Uh, if you have a criticism or a suggestion, I read all my emails 100%. Thank you for tuning in today. We're going to go to John chapter 4 and take a look at the woman in the, the woman at the well. Many years ago, uh, it was in uh, 2005. I decided to transition out of my uh, counseling practice. I was a professional counselor in Phoenix, Arizona for 25 years. I was a secular counselor and uh, I decided to go into the ministry. I felt that's what God wanted me to do. So I did, I transitioned out of that system. And over the years uh, working with people, you know, obviously I saw hundreds and hundreds of clients over the years. I had never actually cured anyone. And when I went into the ministry and was going to transition out of secular counseling to Christian counseling, I told the Lord that I could not do it unless he gave me a revelation on how people can be healed from emotional and mental illnesses. Because I didn't have, with a background in counseling and psychology, I did not have the understanding, the skills, or the knowledge on how to heal people, particularly people who were seriously mentally ill. I did not have that. And so I went to the Lord and, of course, ask and ye shall receive. God gave me a series of divine revelations, many of which I put in this book, Plano Spirits the root cause and cure of mental illness. And you can get that off the website, hardcorechristianity.com. But God gave me a series of revelations that was remarkable, to say the least. And I have seen thousands of people delivered from demons, hundreds and hundreds of people healed from mental illness, hundreds of people physically healed, because of the revelations that God gave me about how the spirit world operates, how the Holy Spirit works, and how demons work, and how it all relates to the human mind. And uh, God showed me that the main spirit in the United States um, that invades all dysfunctional families is the spirit of rejection. That's why Isaiah said uh, that Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus, as you know, on the cross of Calvary, took our sins and our curses and our rejection and nailed it to the cross. He was rejected so you could be accepted. He was made sin for us so you could be forgiven. 
he was made a curse so you and I could be delivered from satanic and generational curses. And rejection is the number one spirit that attacks people who are mentally ill and attacks dysfunctional Christians. And it's the number one spirit that causes emotional and mental problems. God gave me this revelation of the spirit of rejection. I put a whole section here in this book I wrote, Plan of Spirits, on the spirit of rejection. If you, as a human service worker, if you're a Christian and you're a social worker, a counselor, a therapist, psychotherapist, what have you, if you're a Christian, this book is essential for you to understand the clients that you are dealing with, why they're sick, why they behave the way they do, why you have uh, sticking points with them mentally, physically, and emotionally. God showed me how the whole thing works, and I wanted to share it with you today, because if you're going into the ministry, this information is absolutely essential. If you're particularly if you're going into the deliverance ministry or you're going to be counseling people who have mental and emotional illnesses. And by the way, your church is loaded with people that I just described, even if they don't have a diagnosis. Remember this, most people who are mentally ill in the United States have not been diagnosed mentally ill. They don't have a diagnosis. So that means that most of the people running around who are mentally ill haven't been formally evaluated or tested. And they're profuse in our churches now. If you have an interest in ministering to people that are emotionally ill and struggling emotionally and mentally, Today's podcast is going to be a great revelation to you. Tremendous. Well, let's take a look at the Word of God, and uh, that's the foundation of everything. Please turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 4. Fantastic piece of text that's just quite remarkable, to say the least. And here it is, John chapter 4, the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well. Verse number four, Jesus needed to go through Samaria, and uh, he came uh, to a city called Sukkar. By the way, that's that's where Palestine is right now, kind of interesting. And Jacob's well was there. Uh, That well is, I believe, no longer functioning. And uh, it says that uh, Jesus was exhausted from his journey. Uh, That's verse number six. And that's the Greek word, kopayo. He was worn out. Why? Well, they didn't have uh, taxis or Uber back then. Yeah, obviously, uh, poor people had to walk everywhere. Rich people could be carted around in carriages where they would sit down and the slaves would carry, the, carry their carriage with them. But regular people, poor people, middle class folks, everybody walked. It was just like another thing. It was perfectly normal. Jesus is exhausted, so he sits down on this side of this well. It had large uh, circular sides to it, walls. And uh, it was about the sixth hour, it says. That would be about noon, of course. 6 a.m. is the first would be the first hour. And then it says in verse 7, there came a woman, the Greek word for woman there, is a gune. A gune is a wife. A woman from Samaria came to draw the water, and Jesus said to her, give me something to drink. So Jesus is sitting on the side of this well, and she comes walking up, making her daily trip, or whatever it was, to gather water to take home. Everybody did it. So this is around noon, and uh, the disciples 
had left. So Jesus was there alone. They went into the city to buy food, it says in verse 8. Then in verse 9, it says, Why are you talking to me? Okay, back then, uh, Jews were, were prejudiced against intermarriage. Uh, kind of like in America here in the 1950s. Uh, if you married somebody from another race, oh, that was, a, that was a scandal. The worst scandal was whites marrying blacks, blacks marrying whites. Oh, that was a scandal. That was a social stigma. Well, here it was worse than that. Jews were not allowed to have anything to do with Samaritans because they married Gentiles. They intermarried, and so they were very prejudiced against them. There's a lot of details obviously left out of the story, but somehow she knew that he was a Jew, probably by what he was wearing or what he, how he was talking or something. Something triggered it. She said Jews don't have any dealings. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who is speaking to you, if you knew who the person was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you zao water. Zao water in Greek is a verb. And it means to be alive. The process of living. The process of being alive. The water he would have given her was living water, water that's alive. And as you can see, that made no sense at all to this woman because she thinks he's talking about regular water. And she says, you don't have anything to get water out of this well. I mean, I got the bucket. You don't. You can't get any water out. You're just sitting here. The, the well is so deep, there's no way you could reach down there and get any water. She's just humoring him. He said, Zao water. And she goes, well, what he's really talking about is the water in the well. And then she says, are you greater than Jacob? Obviously, you, they come in threes, right? Your family comes in threes. Father, mother, children. The Trinity is in threes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The patriarchs were in threes. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. She said, uh, are you greater than Jacob? The Greek word for greater there is might zone. It means bigger, larger. Are you a bigger deal than Jacob? He gave us the well. He personally drank out of this well. His children and his livestock drank out of this well. I don't understand. What are you saying? Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, shall never thirst again. Obviously, he's talking about eternal life here and spiritual water, living water. But the water that I shall give him shall be in them, not just a well, not, not just a well, he says, but a halomai. The Greek word is halomai. It means to spring forth. It's just not going to be water sitting there. This water, zao, living water, is alive and it's moving and it's springing forth like a fountain. And it springs up alive into everlasting life. Ionios is the Greek word for everlasting there. And it means repetitive ages. Age after age after age after age. It meant eternity or eternal. That word, Ionius, 
is used in the New Testament in connection to both heaven and hell. Many people are teaching today that hell is temporary and that you go there kind of like purgatory and get cleansed and then you get to go to heaven. No, you do not. Some people uh, teach that hell uh, disappears later. It's gone. It does not. The Greek word ionios is applied to both concepts. Heaven is eternal and hell is eternal. So then the woman says, Gune, the wife, she says to him, well, you've convinced me. I like it. Give me this water and so I don't have to thirst anymore. And I'm, I don't have to come here and draw any more water. I'm tired of coming to this well every day and hauling buckets of water back to my house. I'm exhausted of it. Kind of like you are when you were on your journey. You were exhausted. You're sitting at the well. Pooped. Well, I'm pooped. I don't want to have to do this anymore. She's still thinking, obviously, in natural terms. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and then come back here and you will receive this zao, water that's alive, that's moving and springing up into everlasting life. I'll give you the whole thing. Go get your husband. Well, it was a setup, obviously. Jesus, in John chapter 3, was revealed to have the Spirit without measure. That means he had all the gifts of the Spirit working at their maximum capacity. So through the gift of knowledge, at a level no one's ever had before or ever has had since, Jesus had all this information about this woman. The Holy Spirit revealed it to her through the gift of knowledge. And so now he's going to investigate her soul. And the only way to do that is to pull out what's in there. The only way for you to be healed or delivered is for you to open up your heart to God and to reveal what's inside you that you keep hidden from others. What you keep hidden from others and what bothers you about yourself that you don't want anybody else to know has to be confessed, revealed, and released to the Lord in order for you to be healed. Whenever you talk to someone about a sensitive subject in a counseling session or a personal session or just somebody you're talking to, and they say, oh, no, my gosh, I don't want to talk about that. That kind of hurts. I, I'm not, I don't want to think about that. That is a trick of the devil through planet spirits, mind control demons, seducing spirits in the brain. That is a trick of the devil to keep your wounds and your demons buried. Because you don't want to face it anymore. I don't want to think about that. I, want, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to. No. Stop. No. You have to go to the other end. You have to reveal it. Now Jesus is touching on her rejection demons. This poor woman probably grew up in a family where her parents were abusive, verbally abusive, physically abusive, sexually abusive. She was probably sexually abused because she had had multiple affairs and multiple husbands. That's a very common symptom of people who have been sexually abused. And it says here that Jesus is now going to deal with the spirit he revealed to me, the spirit of rejection. Because this demon gets into the person's brain during childhood, and he starts to reprogram how the person thinks about themselves. And he starts to develop within the person, within their soul, a low self-concept, low self-esteem, self Hatred, self-criticism, self-pity. 
the rejection demon also reinforces these thoughts he puts into the child's mind by drawing in people to abuse them. He will draw in people to abuse them. And in your ministry and in your counseling practice, whenever you see someone who has multiple broken relationships over the years, live-ins, divorces, lots of girlfriends, lots of boyfriends, everything severing, that is a red flag. The person has rejection demons. That's a common trail he leaves behind for a person who has rejection. Because the devil draws in spouses, live-ins, boyfriends, girlfriends, lovers, dates. This is all spiritual. People don't understand the power that the kingdom of darkness wields. They don't understand it. But God revealed it to me and he showed me that's exactly how this works. The spirit in the other person works in conjunction with the rejection demon in you. And these spirits come together and they draw that person in. And when they initially come in, they're on their best behavior. Friendly, loving, passionate, the whole deal. And then after they're married, after they move in together, suddenly the spirits switch and they start to attack the other person. They run them down, they disrespect them, they criticize them, they say bad things about them, they physically abuse them, they sexually abuse them, what have you. And then that relationship severs and then the demons bring in the next loser. And the cycle repeats itself literally for decades until the person is so physically, emotionally, and mentally worn out that at the end of their life, they finally just give up. I, I just want to be alone. I give, I quit. I'll never, I'll never have anybody. I'll never be in love. I'll never find love. I'll never find happiness. I am worn out. I quit. And boom, the person ends up usually dying alone or with very few friends. So Jesus now is going to get this woman healed. So he draws out her background of chronic adultery. And in her case, rejection demons teach the person and tell the person that sexual behavior is a form of acceptance. If someone is interested in you sexually, the demons tell you it's because they are accepting you, they like you, they love you, and that's an affirmation that you are a, an accepted and loved and good person. It's, it's actually a complete fraud. It's a trick. And so you see the person getting in multiple relationships over the years or taking back abusive spouses two and three and four times until they're either half beaten to death or dead. And that's what's happening. The, the demons tell them, hey, this person is sexually attracted to you. And that means they're loving you, caring for you, and accepting you. When in fact, it's a fraud. It doesn't mean that at all. And it all goes bad. Go call your husband. And the woman said, well, I don't technically have a husband. And that was true. She wasn't married at the time, right? So in Judaism, you were allowed to get divorced. And in Jesus's day, the uh, rabbis would allow divorces for basically anything. The, requ the require legal requirement was they had to give the person an apostasion, a 
writing of divorcement, divorce papers, severance papers, separation papers, so that the person then could go marry somebody else and verify that they weren't previously married to another spouse. So back then you had, particularly among the Samaritans, you had people with multiple divorces. It was very common. You just give them an apostasion and boom, you're gone. She says, well, I don't, I don't technically have a husband. Well, she had already been released from her previous husband. And now she had found a live-in. And Jesus said, well, that's true. Technically, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the one you're living with now is technically not your husband. That's true. Yeah. So the woman was a was a serial adulterer. And one of the Ten Commandments said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So now the woman is on the spot. But you notice here, there's no condemnation from Christ here. His mission of mercy covers people who have multiple marriages and multiple divorces. What he was getting to in this story was the root of the issue. The spirit of rejection was the one behind all these husbands and all these broken relationships and all these live-in boyfriends. And you can see that clearly back then. You know, it's not like today where in America, women have the right to work and most do work and they can support themselves. The economy is there. Back then, there was no economy. Women did not have hardly any options for employment or and hard, had very few options to support themselves. So it was common for them to live with a husband, live with a boyfriend. It was a ma kind of a matter of necessity. You've got to survive. And when she finds out that he knows her supernaturally and spiritually, she then transitions from who's this strange guy talking about water that's alive to I perceive that you are a prophetes is the Greek word, and it means someone who speaks in the place of God. Apostle is the Greek word, apostolos. It means someone who speaks and acts in the place of God. Okay? In the churches today, particularly among the Charismatics and the Prophetics and the Pentecostals, everybody's a prophet. Everybody's an apostle, and everybody has to have a name tagged on to them. I'm prophet so-and-so, I'm apostle such-and-such, -such, okay? If you run into someone that has that, 99% of the time, it's fake. Do not ever trust one of these prophets or apostles running around the United States in the prophetic and charismatic movements. You will live to regret it. They are not giving prophecies. They're giving what I call spiritual impressions. They have a sense or impression that something's right. And they say, I have a word from the Lord for you. I have something from God. God's, God's saying something. I have a word for you. Because most Christians in the United States are basically gutless and carnal and weak spiritually, they run around from church to church trying to find someone to give them a word because they're too lazy to pray to God to get a word themselves. They're too lazy to study the word and get a word from God through the logos, the word of God. But this woman now perceives for sure that Jesus is not just another Jewish person criticizing her for being a Samaritan and uh, an adulterer. She sees he is someone very special. And that's the purpose of the true gifts. You know, there's 10 gifts of the Spirit. 
the last one mentioned in Corinthians is the most important one. That was the gift of love. Agape is the Greek word for love in that uh, section of text. And it means divine love. There's two forms of love, human love and divine love. In that particular section of text, it's talking about divine love, unconditional love. Human love is conditional. Human agape is conditional. Human beings love the other people conditionally. God does not do that. It's, he has divine love where you are loved unconditionally, whether you're sinning or not, whether you're failing or not whether you're doing what's right or not, doesn't matter. You are loved exactly the same. If you do what's right, you're loved at this level. If you do what's wrong, you're loved at this level. A divine agape love is unconditional. And you can see it demonstrated in this beautiful story. Jesus is talking to her and trying to help her and heal her. And he knows she is a serial adulteress. But he doesn't stop there. He wants to help her. And he wants to use her as a missionary. Now, this woman has a horrible spirit of rejection from childhood, probably. And her whole life has been one of being rejected. One husband after the other, one boyfriend after the other. She's been rejected and rejected and rejected. But today at the well, she is being accepted by God. She being accepted by God. Then she starts to ask him some religious questions. Disputes between Samaritans and Jews. The Jews here have married Gentiles. They mixed their faith. These Jews are prejudiced against these half-Jews. And won't have anything to do with them. And they had doctrinal differences, right? Yeah, we have it, our, we have it here. It's called the denominational system. All these different denominations have doctrinal disputes among each other. And therefore, there can be no unity between the churches. Churches will never unify because they have doctrinal differences that they will not wave or back off of. So she asked him a bunch of questions about where people worship and what mountain you're supposed to worship on and so on. And Jesus did not take the bait. He says to her, quote, you worship what you don't know. The Jews know what what they're worshiping because salvation is of the Jews. That's a Greek word, ek. It means comes out of the Jews. And again, he's referencing himself. Jesus was Jewish. Salvation comes out of the Jews. Speaking about the Lord Jesus. Then he says, don't worry about mountains. That has nothing to do with anything. Don't worry about temples or shrines. That has nothing to do with anything. He says, the hour is coming, and it's already arrived, that the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worshiper, he said, the Father is seeking. That statement is literally shocking because people think God dwells in churches or temples or shrines. The Jews thought Yahweh dwelled in the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus is now wiping out a huge section of their doctrine and that God has now moved into a new temple. You. You are the temple of the living God and the spirit of God dwells in you. 
And you don't need to go to a place or a building for worshiping because worship comes from here. True worshipers worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And God is looking for those kinds of worshipers, not people who have to go to buildings to worship. Now, you can do this in a building, but the building has nothing to do with it. Because you, Paul said, are the temple of the living God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. Then the, she go, then the woman goes on to the Messiah, because now in her mind, she's starting to think, this person may be more than a prophet. He may actually be the Messias. In Hebrew, it, it was a, a, a different word. Messias in Greek means the Moshiach in Hebrew, Messiah. She says, we know that the Messiah is coming. So that was a, a piece of doctrine that they both agreed on, Jews and Samaritans. The Messiah is coming. We agree. Well, that was a point of agreement of their uh, doctrinal disputes. They did not dispute that one. And she said, he will be called the Christos. That's the Greek word for the anointed one, right? The Moshiach. He will be the anointed one. They will call him the anointed one. And he will come. He will tell us. He will tell us all things. And Jesus said, that person is me. That person is me. And he says, the Greek phrase, ego imi, which was the equivalent phrase to the Hebrew phrase, I am that I am. Hayah, hahir, hayah. I am that I am. That Hebrew phrase means, I am the eternal, everlasting, self-existent one. El Shaddai, or Yehovah, Elohim, needed nothing to exist. And that's what it means. He's a self-existent one. Well, in Greek, that Hebrew phrase translated to ego imi. And that's what Jesus used to describe himself. He described himself as the eternal God at the burning bush. You tell them, I am has sent you, Moses. I am the eternal, everlasting, self-existent one. I am the eternal God. And Jesus uses that phrase when he's talking to her. Hey, it's me. It's me. Well, then in the next verse, the disciples come back, and they were absolutely marveling. The Greek word is thumazo. They were in a state of shock that he was talking to a Samaritan gune wife. He couldn't believe it. They thought he lost his mind. But nobody had the nerve to call him on it. They were scared. The woman then sees the guys coming, knows that they are going to condemn her. Her rejection demon manifests, and she bolts. And she left so fast, she left her water pot behind. Her water bucket. She left it behind. That was the reason she came there. That's what God is telling you today. You can leave your childhood, your dysfunctional family, your crazy parents, your disrespectful siblings, and your abusive 
ex-husbands and wives and the demon of rejection that has been tormenting you since you were little, you can leave them behind today like she left that water pot behind. She left the water pot behind. That's what God's telling you. He wants you to leave everything behind. Let it go. Can you, can you do it? God would never ask you to do something that he would not help you do. Then the woman with the rejection demon, whom everybody always rejects and whom no one has any respect for, runs back to her village and says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. This must be the Christos, the Christ, the anointed one. Then they came out of the city and came to Jesus. Now here you see a tremendous truth. God is using somebody, everybody else thinks stinks. Everybody else left her. Nobody likes her. Everybody's rejected her. And she was the first person God came to. I hope you can hear me today on this podcast because I'm telling you life-changing truths. Okay, You have been told you're a total loser, failure, and a gutless wonder. God's looking at you first. It's explained in detail by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And he said in that chapter several several miraculous things, one of which was the things that are rejected and the things that are despised, God has chosen. Is that you today? Hey, if you're suffering from rejection demons, God chose you first. The woman at the well, a serious serial adulteress, a woman loaded with rejection spirits and fear spirits from childhood, abused and abused and rejected woman for decades. She is chosen by God first. And she is turned into a missionary. She goes back to her village and recruits everybody, and they all come out, verse 30, they all came to him. They all came to see Jesus because of her. While she's gone, the disciples are looking at natural things again. The water was natural. Food is natural. Eating is natural. You know, Master, come on. Uh, it's time to eat. We, we're all, everybody's exhausted. Everybody's hungry. And Jesus said, I have meat to eat you don't know about. And in the natural, again, they think, oh, somebody must have slipped him a sandwich. He said, my meat, my food, my nourishment is to do the will of my heavenly father who sent me. And that's exactly what he was doing. He took a rejected woman who is a complete total loser whom everybody else rejected who nobody else accepted and turned her into his first missionary to Samaria if you're on the bottom your heavenly father looked down there first and wants to bring you to the top that's how the holy ghost works he doesn't go to kings and presidents and prime ministers, billionaires, multimillionaires. They're out. The rejected ones at the bottom are in. God goes to them first and rejects billionaires, millionaires, and rulers, kings, royalty, human royalty, gone. He's not interested. Who's he interested in? That would be you. 
Then it says, everybody comes out to see him. And while they're coming, a huge crowd is coming up the hill to the well. Jesus says, look, look at this. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. Well, how did that happen? Well, God took somebody at the bottom of the barrel and started a revival. That's how he operates. The harvest is here. Well, why is the harvest there? Because a woman whom nobody liked, nobody respected, nobody wanted, was wanted by God. He looked beyond her faults and he saw her needs. And this revival would never have taken place had this pitiful woman with this pitiful life not been chosen by God first to trigger the harvest. He says, look, the fields are white with harvest. They're all ready to go. What a story. What a great story, friend. What a great opportunity you have to cast out this rejection demon and get rid of it for the rest of your life. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to set you free from the spirit of rejection. You can do that on our Zoom deliverance and healing service every week at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the code and the password for that Zoom service. You can lay hands on yourself and command the rejection demon from childhood to come out. And he will. And Jesus explained it. Verse 37. One person sows and another person reaps. Look, you sowed nothing you are being used by God to reap. God used someone that nobody else cared about or wanted to sow. And now you, my disciples, are reaping the benefits of it. You didn't do it. They did it. They did it. And many of the Samaritans, it says, quote, believed on him. Because of the saying of the woman, Greek word for saying there is mistranslated in the King James Bible. It's a Greek word, logos. It means words. The word of the woman. Can you imagine that? God took a gune, a wife, a serial adulteress, whom nobody wanted and nobody cared about and had been rejected by everybody, he took her to spread the word to start the revival. I hope you're listening to me today. I'm talking directly to you. You are the woman at the well. You've been rejected by your family and your friends. Your spouse, your ex-spouse, your kids, your stepkids, your employer, the whole nine yards. They all gave you the boot. God never did. In fact, you're perfect for him. First Corinthians chapter one. And these people came out and were harvested by the living Christ. Zao, the, the water that's alive, sprayed out over the Samaritans. And they begged him to come stay with them. Jesus got exactly what he wanted at the well. Jacob, in his wildest dreams, would never have seen the spiritual benefits of his well. Jacob's talking to you today, too, my dear friend. You sow another waters, another reaps. Even if you sow something, it may not look like it's going to go anywhere. It may not look like it has any value. But later on, it can 
Zaal spring forth into everlasting life. Never despise small beginnings when the Holy Ghost is around. He likes taking little things and making them superpowered monsters. Victory is the only thing he knows. And it says, verse 41, many more believed because of Jesus' words. But none of it would have happened had God not chosen somebody at the bottom of the barrel. Now, after you're delivered from rejection demons, you know, whenever it is, hopefully Wednesday night, whenever that happens, you're going to be attacked again. And the rejected demon, when he's cast out, he's going to try and get back in. He sure is. How do I know that? I read verse 42. The people said to the woman, okay, the wife, Gune, we believe in him, but not because of your words. <laughs> <laughs> not because of your words. Now, that's a different Greek word. It wasn't lagos. It was lalia. It means not because of what you said. We don't believe because of what you said. We heard him ourselves. And we know that what you said is correct. This is indeed Christos, the anointed one, the Christ. He is the savior of the world. The Greek word is cosmos there. It means human world, humanity. He is the savior. The Christ, the Christos, the anointed one, is the savior of humanity. We know this now. So when you go through your deliverance Wednesday or hopefully today or tomorrow, what have you, once you get this rejection demon, by the way, if I've cast out lit, literally, I'm not exaggerating this, thousands of these rejection demons. The reason that I've cast out so many of them is because they're so common. Here in America, the spirit of rejection is a superpowered spirit, and he's in every single dysfunctional family you can imagine. November 5th, we have monthly or bimonthly children's deliverance services at the Arizona Deliverance Center. We're downtown Phoenix at 3342 North 15th Avenue. We're at Osborne Road and 15th Avenue, downtown Phoenix. It's a red brick building. November 5th on a Saturday at 10 o'clock, please bring your son or your daughter uh, if they're 12 years and under so they can be delivered from this spirit of rejection because this is the demon that is the first domino that lets in all the other demons. He's the gatekeeper. He is the road. He's the tunnel for all the other demons to come through. Once the rejection demon gets into the child's brain and convinces the child that they are substandard, useless, worthless, not loved, rejected, shunned. Once they convince the child to start criticizing themselves and nitpicking themselves, that opens the door for all the other spirits. Usually fear gets in right away. Fear gets in right away. If you have someone who's mentally ill, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, severe mental illnesses. This demon that I've just told you about, the spirit of rejection, was the one that started it all. He's the one that let in DID, the demons that create multiple personalities within a person. He's the one that let those spirits in. Once you get him out, your entire life is going to change and change huge. I gave detailed information in my book here. Planos spirits. On the back, dissociative identity disorder, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, anxiety disorder, emotional illnesses, mental illnesses. I went through all of them in this book, giving case studies out of the scriptures, 
case studies out of my personal experience counseling. That is a book you absolutely have, have to have, particularly if you are in the human service field and you are working with people who are mentally and emotionally ill. This story is John chapter 4 is almost incomparable. Almost incomparable. It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible. It reveals how valuable you are to God. It reveals God's attitude about people and how much he gravitates toward the bottom sector of our society. People that are lost, people that are rejected. God wants to save homeless people, mentally ill people, lonely people, broken people, lost people first before he looks at saving millionaires, billionaires, kings, queens, what have you. They're secondary. The people at the bottom are primary. Now, that woman had five husbands and unknown numbers of lovers, and who knows how many men she had lived with. And let me explain something to you, whether you're male or female. You can only get married so many times before you're shot. You can only live with so many people until you're finished, emotionally, mentally, and physically. You will literally break down physically from having sex with all these people. You will physically break down giving your heart and your love and your emotions to people who trample on it. You will see it physically. You will notice that people, their faces age prematurely. Their bodies get sick easily. Their bodies droop and age precipitously. You will see that the emotions directly affect the body. The seat of your emotions is your soul. The seat of your spirituality is your spirit man. Your seat of your free will is your mind. Your morality center is your conscience. Your soul is what the rejection demon attacks the most. Your emotions, he wants to ruin them. Once a demon can control your emotions. It's easy to control someone's mind, and they both work together. Negative thoughts generate negative emotions. Dreadful thoughts generate fear emotions. So easy to see. Emotional illnesses are caused by trauma and the spirit of rejection. He is an expert in this field, and he will tear your life to shreds like a pack of lions, just like he tore this poor woman at the well. She had lived a miserable life. Can you imagine being married five times plus have a bunch of live-ins? You are just virtually totally shot. You're shot. Living with that much disappointment, that much upheaval you, are you kidding no she was probably only god knows what was really wrong with her that wasn't revealed in the text the text really doesn't reveal much about personal things that i would be interested in I've been a counselor for 40 years my gig is people not things i'm a people person and that's all i've ever done is people very little is revealed in the text in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the emotions and the inner workings of people. But because I understand people better than 99.9% .9 of other people, I can kind of see the background on these people based on the responses and the things they say. And I know this woman at the well was a broken, hurting person. I know for a fact she was chosen first before anybody else was chosen. I know that everybody else had rejected her by the response they gave her after she brought them a revival. You would have thought all these people would 
be saying, oh my goodness, you went to the well that day. Thank you. And thanks for telling us about, no, not nothing. No way. The devil's not going to thank you for anything. He's just going to keep stomping your face in. They did it to her. Oh, we don't believe because you told us. We 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 believe because we saw it. That was a that was the devil stabbing her in the back again. But this time, by faith, I don't believe she accepted it. I think she went with what Jesus said. I think she took that zao, that living water. I think she sprang herself up into everlasting life. That's my personal opinion. I think that's what happened. And I know that's going to happen to you. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock on the Zoom. Now, remember, we broadcast on multiple platforms our Thursday and Friday night teachings at the Arizona Deliverance Center. That's at 7 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Arizona time, preaching, teaching, healing, and deliverance at both services. Trust me, it's going to be worth your while. I taught uh, Friday night at the Deliverance Center, very unusual teaching about how Christians can stop the will and the power of God. I laid it out so a second grader could understand it. You might want to catch that teaching. You can go there on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash house of healing AZ. YouTube.com slash house of healing AZ. We're on other platforms as well. And I listed that in my PowerPoint presentation. You can go there and watch it. Remember, if you're at the bottom of the barrel, you're being seen by God before everybody else. And your Heavenly Father is looking at you first.